Hi, this is Mike Edelhart, and I'm here with another edition of Inception, our podcast, now video cast, about beginnings, the beginnings of uh, companies, of new ideas, and culture, community, science, uh, sometimes a little glimpse of the future. And uh, I'm here today uh, with David Stevens and Brian Tran, who are among the founders of Seraph, which is one of our most recent, and I think most interesting, most unique, most promising uh, portfolio companies. It's uh, great to have a chance to uh, chat with you guys. Thank you, Mike. That's so kind of you. Well, it, it's the truth. So, you know, uh, we should get into the fundamentals of, you know, what is Seraph and what are you doing? But, you know, this is one of those companies that it's a community. It's uh, tokenized. It's focused on LBGTQ. So is it a queer community that has tokens? Is it a tokenized community that happens right now to have queer people in it? Uh, um, how would you guys describe it? And of all the things with your backgrounds, because you've had pretty successful backgrounds that you could do, why this? Totally. Um, let's start with backgrounds and then go into the origin story. Um, sure. David, why don't, why don't you kick off and I'll, I'll take it from there. Yeah, I'm happy to. So I'm David, co-founder and CTO of Serif. Um, I'm coming into the Web3 space from artificial intelligence and data science. I started my career on the growth team at Uber, um, where I was doing data science for them for a couple of years back in 2015 to 2017. Uh, from there, I moved down to Argentina and that, that was really where I was first exposed to how people were using cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies. Um, they were using it for cross-border payments and remittances and really as a stable store of value against the hyperinflation of their own currency. Um, but before I jumped into Web3 full-time, I moved back to New York. Um, I was at Peloton for a couple of years on the computer vision team and um, made the leap into Web3 with Serif uh, full-time in December. I've I've had a very wildly different career than David. I started my um, professional life in design and product at large consumer tech companies like Pandora. Then I moved into the venture capital world as a designer in residence at Kleiner Perkins, where I was working between their seed stage team, their venture teams to support portfolio companies and internal initiatives. I had a lot of fun, but you know, I just miss being on the ground intimately with teams and getting things um, launched. And so I went back into portfolio companies to help um, our companies launch their various products. Things were going great, acquisitions left and right. After um, an acquisition from Stripe, you know, I wanted to explore and do my own thing, right? And answer the question um, of, and a problem of experience as I've come out of the closet at 13, you know, how do LGBTQ people form more meaningful connections, right? Sarah really started with, you know, coming out at a young age and not having any resources or ways to meet people. And then moving to San Francisco out of all places and realizing that I was still relying on exclusively bars, clubs, and hookup apps to form my community, right? And although fun, not exactly the most meaningful way to have connections with people because you're mostly focused on, you know, partying and hooking up and dating, which are, you know, necessary things, but not the end all be all. Um, and then fast forward, um, as of recently, um, you know, David and I uh, were monitoring what's been unfolding in the Web3 space just because we are enthusiasts by nature and noticed that the conversation topic and discourse specifically with NFTs was shifting towards how these um, primitives could be used to um, own identity and culture. And it, it gave me pause, right? Because when you think about culture and all of its aspects from film, art, music, fashion, um, literature, it's impossible to ignore the contributions that LGBTQ people will have made throughout its entire lifetime and development. But we noticed very quickly that there weren't any LGBTQ people talking about this in the NFT world. And a yeah. light bulb went off in our head and we said, wait, we need to make sure 
that not only we have a seat at the table, but that we are a part of the innovation because historically we have seen what happens when queer people are left out of the picture um, of innovation that reshapes economies. We've seen what happens in healthcare, right? You can't visit your significant other when they're sick. We've seen what happens in institutional finance when you can't build wealth. Um, it's, it's the same story and Seraph, you know, was not only designed to create community for LGBTQ creators and leaders to connect, but also to get exposure into to Web3. Mm -hmm. And frankly, that's one reason why we were really interested when you guys popped up, apart from just impressive backgrounds. This was one of the, we're pretty interested in community. We always have been. Uh, uh, early community, Pinterest and all that, and even way back when, early tech communities when folks were doing things like telnetting and you know, early email and anything to stay in touch and help one another uh, out. Uh, but uh, uh, we believe very strongly in, in the notion of communities of consequence where things that are going on really matter. Yeah. And, uh, and we saw that here and we also felt we're uh, on the one hand really into crypto and private currency. I started one of the, maybe the first online uh, uh, private currency uh, project, but like in the 90s, so way too early, we had a Fed Janet Yellen was on the Fed and all that sort of stuff for a private currency backed by GM. But, but our funds haven't been super active because we're seeing a lot of fraud, a lot of stuff that uh, is interesting on the face of it, but not fundamental. And you guys showed up not only with consequence, but you've woven the NFTs into the community. Uh, and, and, using them in a way we'd never seen before. And we were just fascinated about this could actually work. And, and <laughs> if it works, this could really be something. So we should probably talk about that. So it's tokenized, but uh, explain how it, and what this community is there for. So, you know, it's just that LBGQ is kind of a label, but who are the people? And what are you hoping to get them to do? And what are you hoping they'll contribute? And, and what do the NFTs have to do with it? So, um... Totally agree with you, Mike. Community is a, a, a blanket term and members of communities are also very specific, right? And as we've seen Seraph evolve, we have been able to attract um, leaders and creators who happen to be LGBTQ, right? Um, leaders, what does that mean, right? That That is as understandable as a Fortune 100 executive, um, you know, um, to a startup founder all the way to a, um, an activist, right? Um, and then creator, what does that mean? That could be an artist and writer all the way to an OnlyFans creator, right? We, that's the, the whole spectrum of Seraph, right? And so some of our members, um, you know, I think about, you know, Jim Fielding, who was the former head of retail for Disney, right? I think of uh, Nick Casey. Um, they are one of the most recognizable and contributing activists in the LA metro area. I think of, you know, McLean Thomas, one of the most prolific artists of our times, right? Um, it's rare that you have these types of leaders and creators in one space because, they, they're also different, right? And I think what bonds them is actually more than just being LGBTQ, but this innate desire to um, not only connect, but also to address and help um, other people like them and the problems that they've experienced, right? They, these people have experienced so much success in their personal and professional lives. They have this desire and they're joining Seraph because they want to figure out how to help um, the communities that they represent. And um, I think what David will share with you about how the community is organizing and how the NFT specifically enable that as an instrument is, is going to be really fascinating. So David, why don't you take it away? Sure. And before I dive into the tokenization aspects of it, which of course, as the tech person, I'm super excited to talk about, I just want to add another layer to why the queer community that we're building is of consequence and why it's so needed. Um, I think the best way to describe this is from 
I'm, I'm getting this concept from a book I'm reading right now called The Queer Advantage. And it's a series of conversations with LGBTQ plus leaders like Margaret Cho, Troy, Troy Savon, Dominique Jackson, Michael Kors. And it talks about the power of identity and asks them questions like, how is being queer advantaged you in your career and in your life? And the common thread in all of their answers is the power of the queer network, really. Um, being queer gives you the ability to connect instantly with people whom you've never met before on the basis of a shared identity, right? That's, that's often at odds with what society says is okay. And so being queer is really a powerful force that bonds our community together. And so many leaders have tapped into this and used it as a source of strength, as an advantage. Uh, and so I guess when I think about why we need to build Seraph and why we need to build a queer community, it's about taking the queer advantage and making it more visible where any queer person can tap into this network, no matter where they are in the world and find a source of community strength and advantage. Um, and so that's where that, that concept of, uh, okay, no matter where you are in the world, that's where we start to enter the digital realm. And that's where the aspect of tokenization starts to come in and become really important. Um, when we first started thinking about, okay, why is tokenization an important aspect for the community? We wanted to figure out how do we use this to enable the community building that we tried to do. And I think the biggest thing for us is that using a token enables us to flip the script in a way. And instead of extracting value from the community and saying, okay, we're going to monetize our community's attention, or we're going to sell their data as a way to, um, carry on and, and make money, we can instead drive value back to the community because they're NFT holders. And as we create more value for the community, in theory, the value of the NFT goes up. And so they share in the upside, the community shares in the upside, and they also have decision-making power and capability in what we do, which is a complete paradigm shift from the more centralized web two way that things were being done uh, previously. Yeah, I, it's fascinating to me. And the, the notion of right from the beginning, creating a, a business where uh, you guys are developing it, but you're uh, sharing it and seeing the uh, uh, benefit uh, role to the participants. Mm -hmm. Clearly the generation before did the exact opposite. Talk about extraction. I mean, dining out on almost uh, everything you do. We talk about all kinds of things here and we'll talk about a, a topic in partner meeting. And even though the big five aren't in the partner meeting next day, that topic is all over my feet. And, uh, you know, it, it's, um, I don't like it. it it's, uh, it's intrusive. It's also forcing those companies to spend money on somebody, me, who's not a customer, but is talking about them in a completely different context. And uh, thinking about this, that we're all in it together and we should all benefit together. We're all contributing. We're all taking our part. Uh, uh, I thought was uh, quite wonderful. Uh, and so any indications it's actually working? It's pretty early, but that you're going out and you're saying, hey, you can be part of this community. We can leverage the networks. You can help lead our people, if you want to call it that, and benefit from doing so. Any indications of folks on the other side are going, I'm down with that. Let me in. I mean, yeah. So we actually launched officially a couple of weeks ago. And um, what did that mean? Our our minting site went live, our, our token dropped, and um, we started accepting applications. And I think an important note here is, you know, typically when you think of NFTs, right? Um, you have to be on a list to mint and, you know, there's a public mint where, you know, anyone who has a wallet address, there is an allocated um, pool carved out for them. For Seraph specifically, um, we don't buy into any of that. What we have to do is um, you have to apply to join Seraph. I think where Brian is going is that um, we, we have an application-based NFT minting process. And the way that we're able to see, okay, there is actually demand for this is the number of applications that come in. And since we've launched, we've received over 4,000 applications. And so that to us is an indication that, yes, this is something that people want, they're excited about this. And then I think the other stat that really speaks to what uh, is going well about what we're working on is that over 60% of the people that are minting a Seraph NFT have created a wallet 
just for this. Uh, this is their very first NFT. And to us, that represents success for bringing more queer people into the space, which is a huge goal for us because we want to make sure that this nascent technology is shaped by the communities that it's most going to affect, which is often marginalized communities. Right. And just to add on to that, um, you know, to date, we have over, what, 5,000 people who have applied to join Seraph. And this is not, you know, you, you submit your email address, right. and you, you know, you're on the list, right? You have to fill out a very lengthy application that minimum takes 15 minutes. We ask very deep questions about what you're looking for, why you want to join Seraph. Um, we ask for your bio and we ask you 21 questions, including your social security number. I'm just kidding. Uh, we don't go that far, but we might as well, right? Your seed phrase. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's like immigrant, really. Uh, it, it felt to me that you're uh, applying to be a citizen here to some degree, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's non-trivial. That for us, you know, is an expression of consequence. So folks are willing to put in the work in a way, and right. uh, uh, to get this going. So let's imagine that it does work. So people apply and they come in as foundational members, and as foundational members, they're working to build this community and proposing ideas. And you guys are responding, and there's micro communities and new capabilities and all that sort of stuff grows out of the interaction. And so this thing starts to grow like Topsy. What then? So it's growing like Topsy. You have all these people interacting with one another and creating ideas. Um, how is this a business as opposed to a social movement or uh, you know, the gay equivalent of the Southern Baptist Conference or something? <laughs> That is, that is a really good question, right? Um, I think community generally is hard because you're fulfilling, a, uh, you know, a, a human need that, you know, should just be table stakes for everyone. But um, how do you, you know, build a sustainable business that not only allows the community to grow, but also provides resources for the community? And also, how do you think about the, the broader community that surrounds them, right? Um, I think historically, you know, we group LGBTQ people all as one, but the reality is it's a very fragmented landscape. And we are very quick to acknowledge that, look, we can't serve everyone, but we can serve specifically leaders and creators, right? That's a very behavioral profile that um, we've been able to, to gather and to connect. And as we think about our business, you know, membership model, a membership based model um, on an annual basis is is the key, right? So for us, your NFT very much acts as a um, initiation fee. And um, technically, you can trade your NFT on the open market, but you're discouraged to because your identity is tied to it. And even if you were to acquire um, a Seraph NFT on the secondary market, um, you wouldn't reap the full benefits until you're officially accepted into the community. And so um, I, I think it's also helpful here to understand what are the key benefits and utilities of our NFT, because that really expands into um, the, the core business and also the ancillary businesses that could happen as well. So the biggest utility is that um, you get rights to purchase membership into the physical locations that we're building around the world. Um, we're starting in the U.S., obviously, but we'll expand from there. Um, we have a number of perks and benefits that um, we've done in partnership with local businesses and CPG brands. Um, so this is everything from Rebud, where if you show them our NFT, you get 20% off your cannabis purchase, to Solace Health, where your first visit to a doctor's office there is free. So we really think about this very similarly to an Amex rewards program, but targeted towards um, LGBTQ life. And um, of course, there's a Web3 educational aspect that comes with this. But, um, you know, for the interim, um, I think a big part of our business is really membership into these physical spaces that will have its own annual fee um, that is fiat based. But as we think about how to grow and include other members who don't fit into our traditional um, membership spaces, we totally foresee a digital membership where you can digitally connect 
attend things um, that are local, but also globally via digitally um, our app, and then have access to our benefits and perks programs that we spelled out. So I'm really curious. Uh, so I'm sitting here, I'm not sure where you are, Brian. I think you're in San Francisco, but I'm basically looking out my window uh -huh. down the hill at the Castro Theater sign. So uh, I'm in that neighborhood and there isn't a gay community. There are like 427 gay yeah. communities here. There are guys in kilts, there are guys in leather, there are guys that you know dress like Clark Kent. There are people walking around with nothing on but golden cod pieces and they're trans and they're so in that kind of very diverse community i have to imagine that on any topic there is opinion a and then there's counter opinion b c d e f g so how do you keep this from breaking down into chaos if the community has some involvement in what happens and what matters more uh, how do you you know keep this from becoming like the israeli parliament where it's just nothing but pure argument all the time. So, uh, Mike, I think what you're touching on right now is one of the hottest debates in the tokenized community community, the tokenized community meta community, if you will, uh, about how to do governance well. And nation states are figuring it out. Um, the US has one model that may or may not be working. And tokenized communities have the opportunity to say, huh, we can sort of rethink governance. And a lot of them are falling on, okay, let's take our token and weight votes by the number of tokens that people have, which ends up just kind of mimicking capital in the real world. So I think where we're heading towards is certain people are better suited to make certain decisions, right? Like if the decision is where to purchase the next property, then someone with real estate experience or who's a licensed realtor in those areas, their opinion should likely be weighted more than like my opinion, where I know absolutely nothing about the real estate in New York, for example, right, or LA. Um, so where that's heading with Web3 is there's something called verifiable credentials. These are off-chain credentials that's, that kind of qualitatively say, here's what I know, here's what I'm credentialed for, here's what I'm an expert in, and allow you to access that on-chain. So the short answer to your question is, okay, it, it, I think the answer is if everyone were to try to vote and come to a consensus on every decision, then it would devolve into chaos. Right. But if instead you take the issue at hand and you take the people that are best suited and prepared to answer it and, and layer in verifiable credentials, decentralized identity, and use that to weight the decision, then I think we have a much more promising governance model. It would be fantastic if we could do it. it. It feels like that's the case where everybody feels it's not exactly what they would want, but it's close. And uh, uh, because of However, you've got the uh, statistics running under the hood. Mm -hmm. It relatively reflects the uh, uh, prevailing majority view on the topic at hand that matters the most right now. Uh, uh, really, really hard to do. Um, but if folks can come to trust that way, then uh, uh, it's an extraordinary amount of power, not just in this community, but potentially in any community, which maybe leads to a Question. So is this an LBGTQ community now and forever? Or is this an LBGTQ community? Because the LBGTQ community is a pretty yeasty community. And as you were saying, Brian, historically gets in early, sets trends, has courage, you know, uh, teaches to some degree the broader uh, uh, culture what they don't know that they're ready to get interested in next, but here it comes. So are you starting there because this community is actually likely to do stuff or is this the community? And, and based on that, do you expect other communities? And if so, which ones, when, and on what basis? I mean, that's a great question, right? I mean, first and foremost, you don't have to be LGBTQ to join Seraph, right? You know, in that alphabet, there is a letter A for ally, which is reserved for, you know, um, you know, straight people for lack of a better word right who are interested in making sure that we have not only safe spaces but you know our agendas moving forward right so that's why we appreciate 
people like you who are partners in this and who believe in the greater mission of what Seraph can do. So we, we welcome everyone who is invested in our community and its success. Um, as we think about, you know, what I would predict, you know, at our, um, in our many inflection points of growth is that Seraph becomes just quite simply a forward thinking community whose DNA is an innovation across um, technology and culture. Um, we're pushing the boundaries in arts, we're pushing the boundaries of what's happening with um, Web3, and we're combining it all together to um, empower community connection and creation, right? Um, I think our hope is that, and our point of view and posture on Web3 is that it should be user-friendly and it should enable um, things to move faster for communities. Um, it shouldn't be the star of the show. Um, David, I'm sure you have some thoughts, so feel free to add on to that. Yeah, I like what you said about not making Web3 necessarily the star of the show. I think our stance has always been, we see that this is a tool to enable greater community building and more uh, intimate forms of community building. But unfortunately, the state of the tooling right now is such that it can't just be swept under the rug or under totally under the hood. And so it does have to be at the forefront in a lot of ways of what we're doing. Um, the only thing that I would add to this is, I think Seraph's DNA is rooted in queerness and we are committed to maintaining and creating spaces um, for queer people, right? And yes, it's it's at the forefront of innovation and culture and, and what Web3 tokenized communities, but um, I think continuing to focus on the queer community and making sure that um, they have a unique space in a world that is very much set up for heteronormativity and every other space is, you know, a straight space in a lot of ways. I think that's um, core to Seraph's DNA. I mean, given that, so when you guys started this, uh, maybe you're really prescient, but I don't know that you were picking up fully on uh, Roe v. Wade going down and sidecar opinions going, we should go after everything that's been considered modern and that the framers didn't happen to uh, uh, include in the original documents and you know a sense that, well, here we go, right back to the 19th. 50s, everybody, uh, uh, furtive folks uh, in the shadows underneath the Lower West Side Highway late at night, uh, loud and proud, forget about it. Uh, so how do you feel about all that? How much do you think that is affecting you? And then alongside it, there's been, a, you know, sort of a collapse in crypto and all that too. Uh, so headwinds? head tsunami? Uh, <laughs> how do you all uh, view that as you're launching into it? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a great question. And my initial thoughts go to history as a funny way of repeating itself. Um, as we think about, you know, Roe versus Wade, right? I see it more as um, macro politics at play again, right? Um, and not specifically Roe versus Wade, but like what that postures for other landmark cases, right? Especially ones that are concerning um, the LGBTQ community. And if we kind of examine what has happened since ancient history to maybe even rolling back more recently um, in the, the 70s um, and early 80s, um, you know, there were times when LGBTQ people were thriving and heavily and widely accepted into cultural society, right? Um, there is um, a person that comes to mind, Christine Jorgensen, um, mm -hmm. who I believe was in the army, rose to fame, um, especially in the 70s and 80s on all talk shows and was openly trans, um, was widely celebrated. But then of course, you know, we know what happened after that in terms of political events where things just tightened up and got more conservative, right? Um, and we have always just sort of hit the reset button, right? And this has, again, existed since like ancient Roman Greece. And so what I think is powerful about Web3 is that with blockchain technologies, you can't erase history. You can't erase, you know, who is attributed to what, right? And the questions that we think about are like, okay, like what if, Alan Turing's work, you know, um, 
his identity was documented, you know, on the blockchain, right? Um, what could have happened? Um, we think about the history that was lost that was never documented, right? Like, how could that have survived, you know, without a fire, right? I think these are the ex things that keep us at Seraph awake and excited to continue pushing the boundaries of what this technology can do. And I don't think we're gonna get it right initially, but we are getting close and um, especially with the community experience. That's really interesting. If things get really, really bad, you could be the library of Alexandria <laughs> uh, in a way for all of the, this. You know, we could talk on and on and on and we're uh, over time. But, uh, uh, so I feel like we sort of have to wrap though. I don't want to wrap, but uh, so one last question. If, if we get together and do this again a year from now, which we will, and, and things go just as you hope they will, what will we be talking about? What will Sarah look like a year from now? Oh, David, you want to go first and I'll go last? I can start, yeah. Um, so to me, success for Sarah in a year is allowing the person in Kentucky or the person in, you know, abroad who doesn't have access to a queer community locally uh, to be able to access our digital membership and tap into the power of the queer network and the queer community wherever they are. Um, that to me represents success and that's really what we're going to be building for in the next year. Um, this is an analogy so entertain me. I think um, before um, you know churches you know, had all their scandals, media and television talked about them in very specific ways. You know, they were philanthropic, um, you know, goodwilled uh, Samaritans, um, but very powerful. I think that will be what we'll talk about from a year from now, how Seraph has become um, a thriving community that is able to affect um, industries and economies um, that have improved the lives of other people. Got it. Great stuff. Uh, great idea to end on. Thank you very much. Thanks for starting this. We're delighted and proud to be involved. Uh, looking forward to all the unexpected things that might uh, happen. Right? Looking forward to getting a chance to actually meet you, meet you here in a, a couple of days. Mike, thank you so much for everything. Sure thing. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mike.